Hello, my name is Mark Reed. I am a professor of socio-technical innovation at Newcastle University. I'm going to talk to you today uh, about how it is that research and evidence uh, from wherever that comes gets into policy. Uh, and in particular, uh, I'm looking here at uh, evidence around uh, land degradation, soil degradation, uh, and some of the potential solutions uh, around sustainable land management uh, that you've been learning about uh, elsewhere uh, on this course. There's so much evidence out there, so many great ideas. Uh, some of this very robust evidence, solutions that have not been thought of before, that have been proven to work, the question is, how can we actually ensure that some of these great ideas become mainstreamed and that policymakers, whether at regional, national or international levels, uh, can uh, A, find out, B, understand, and C, be convinced that actually this is something worth implementing that will actually have benefits uh, for them and for the people that they, uh, that they represent. Essentially, there are two routes that I want to, to talk about, uh, formal mechanisms uh, and informal mechanisms. Uh, and I'm going to focus primarily on the, on the informal. Um, but first of all, uh, the, the formal mechanisms. Uh, I'm going to reference you back to some of the material uh, that you've already heard uh, from colleagues of mine, such as uh, Lindsay Stringer, who has uh, studied uh, science policy interfaces and in particular the SPI uh, of the, um, uh, the United Nations Convention to Combat Desertification. Uh, and of course, there are uh, a number of formal mechanisms that uh, governments and international bodies have for channeling uh, knowledge and evidence, uh, whether that be scientific knowledge or uh, local knowledge, into the, the policy-making process. Uh, and uh, through special reports, um, meta-analyses, uh, systematic reviews, uh, rapid evidence syntheses, uh, other kind of mechanisms, uh, these um, interfaces, these, these bodies, uh, try and uh, collate the evidence as it stands uh, across the board, not just based on a single study, across the board, to provide uh, uh, an evidence base uh, upon which decisions can reliably uh, be made. Uh, in addition to this, uh, many governments uh, and bodies uh, will run inquiries, uh, they will run consultations, uh, and there will be a, a number of different formal uh, opportunities for you to present uh, evidence uh, around, for example, uh, the, the pressures, the threats, uh, the, uh, the problems arising from a soil degradation, uh, as well as uh, what, what you think may be some of the, some of the solutions. Uh, and I think there is no uh, replacement for engaging in these. You can't get away without engaging in these, these formal processes uh, if you want to be uh, taken seriously. Uh, and I think the questions probably rightly would be asked if, uh, if you always sidestepped the formal processes and went straight into the informal processes. Uh, I have, over the last uh, decade or so, uh, been studying uh, policy pathways to impact, uh, as well as a range of other pathways to impact, to try and understand what is it that really works. Uh, why is it that some ideas, some bits of knowledge, some bits of evidence get into policy and practice and make a difference, change lives, uh, improve the environment, while others get stuck, uh, aren't believed, are contested uh, uh, and simply don't go anywhere and have, have no impact uh, whatsoever. Uh, and, um, and specifically as part of, uh, of this work, I have tr sought to, to understand uh, the role that uh, different types of inter intermediary can play, whether formally or informally. Uh, and there are a number of formal organisations, whether that be uh, the science policy interface of the UNCCD, uh, which Lindsay's talked about, uh, whether it be the other Rio Convention science policy interfaces, um, such as the Intergovernmental Panel 
uh, on uh, ecosystem services and sustainability, um, uh, IPBAS, uh, or the uh, UN Convention Framework Convention on Climate Change, uh, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Uh, these are some of the formal mechanisms that channel uh, channel this 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 knowledge. Um, there are organisations that exist uh, simply to advise governments uh, around the world uh, on that evidence, uh, whether that be civil service uh, departments, uh, evidence analysts, policy analysts, uh, whether this, uh, these be agencies uh, who are in charge of particular areas where they have to uh, do evidence-based work and, and advise government on the latest uh, evidence. Uh, and in the, the research that I've done, I've been trying to understand how important these formal networks, formal uh, organisations uh, and processes are, uh, but also how some of the, the more informal processes work in parallel. Uh, and now, based on that understanding, uh, if I have some evidence that I want to submit to, to government that I think is in the public interest and that uh, needs to be taken forward in some way, then in addition to those formal mechanisms, uh, I will try and find a range of informal ways in which I can make sure that that evidence is heard by the right people in a way that they understand, that resonates with them, uh, and that is more likely to actually translate into a policy, a decision, an action, a practice, something that will actually make a difference on the ground. Uh, uh, given the focus uh, of this course uh, uh, on uh, soil degradation and issues connected to, to soil, uh, I thought it might be interesting to, uh, to just show you uh, some of my most recent work uh, uh, in a case study looking at uh, how uh, evidence uh, on soils uh, and climate change uh, has got into policy and practice in uh, a particular national context, uh, and this is the Scottish context uh, where I live, uh, where I'm recording this from. And um, what we did with this study was we, uh, we took um, uh, over 70 different research findings and uh, we tried to then trace how those research findings had travelled from person to person through peer-to-peer -peer networks uh, and got uh, eventually to policy or practice uh, or kind of got stuck somewhere in that social network and didn't pass on any further and didn't reach uh, anyone who might be able to actually use that. Uh, or it reached them and they decided actually this was not robust enough and they didn't want to use it for whatever reason. Uh, and in this diagram, uh, you can see what, uh, what this looks like. Um, so this is a kind of a stylized uh, version of the social network diagram that, uh, that came out of this uh, statistical work. Uh, and you can see here uh, a number of circles. The circles uh, represent uh, organizations uh, and uh, they are proportional to the size uh, of uh, their, uh, their influence, uh, effectively. Uh, and so you have uh, larger uh, circles uh, where there is lots of information coming into them and going out of them, uh, and uh, smaller ones where there, there is much less information uh, coming in and out. Uh, and then you can see the arrows between these circles which denote those flows of information, uh, and the thicker the arrow, the more information travelling between one uh, type of organisation and another. Uh, and so in this you can see um, that at the bottom we've got um, uh, the, the government, which is uh, fairly large uh, and influential, as you might expect. Uh, and um, coming into that, uh, a whole series of arrows. Everyone is trying to communicate their evidence to government. Uh, and uh, interestingly, you have researchers um, uh, with a little arrow going around into themselves who are very good at communicating uh, research uh, to their colleagues uh, within the research community. Uh, they also put uh, that information into scientific journals and are pretty much the only people reading those scientific journals as well. Um, uh, and uh, there are links directly into government, um, but actually the most influential route through which that evidence is passing into government is indirect. This is going through uh, non-governmental organisations and government agencies. Um, now, this is a strength and a weakness. Uh, on one hand, uh, this is a strength. 
we now have the opportunity to identify organisations that um, have a statutory remit uh, or have other forms of power and influence that mean that they can be a very efficient and effective conduit for the evidence that we may have uh, to give to government. Uh, and this is great news for, for me as a researcher because it means that uh, I can talk to someone uh, who's hopefully quite accessible in that organisation and they then do the hard work of translating that into the policy process and talking to the relevant people in government who perhaps they have easier access to than I may have. Of course, there's a weakness in this as, <coughs> as well, <coughs> which is that uh, I have to trust that they will do a good job of that. And the danger is that those organisations cherry pick the research findings that they like. Uh, and worst case scenario, they distort those for their own interests. Uh, and potentially they do that now in my name based on my research, but a misinterpretation or a biased or selective interpretation of, uh, of, of my work, of my evidence. And now that's my name getting dragged through the mud. Um, and so uh, for me, central to all of this is trust, uh, whether that's direct or indirect. Uh, there was a study just recently published um, looking at a uh, UK government uh, survey of politicians asking them uh, what evidence do you access and how do you trust the evidence that you access. Uh, encouragingly, the number one criterion uh, was uh, we trust this based on the content. If I read this and this looks trustworthy based on the content, um, then, then that's worthy of trust, uh, which I think is a, a fairly good criterion. Uh, the second criterion in this study was uh, actually, who gave this to me? How did I find out about this? Um, and how much do I trust the person who sent this to me or who recommended this to me? Uh, and whether that's direct or indirect, uh, very often, uh, as a policymaker, you need these shortcuts to trust. Uh, I don't have time now to read all of the underpinning research, the original research articles behind the policy brief that has been given to me. I don't have time to research the CVs of the researchers who generated that evidence and to find out if in fact they are paid by oil companies to generate evidence that might be sceptical of climate change. Um, and so I will rely on proxies for trust, um, such as uh, the logos of the research funders and the universities and the others who are behind this policy brief. I trust them, so probably I trust the content in this. Uh, or I know this researcher, I've spoken to them, I've looked them in the eye, I, I have a history of working with them and I have seen uh, the reliability, the quality, the neutrality, the independence of the work they've done in the past. I trust you as a person, therefore I trust uh, your evidence without having to go and interrogate your research design and, and, and pull this apart. Uh, and what uh, the research that I've been doing on this uh, is very clearly showing is that uh, this process um, of getting evidence into policy uh, is more than you might expect uh, a social process. Uh, and as a social process, this is a process which hinges on trust. This is about key individuals, key organisations who have earned a position of trust, who are central, uh, in that social network, uh, who are well known and respected. Uh, and uh, as a result of that, uh, they have access to the right people at the right time, uh, and they are able to be trusted, listened to, and, and people act on, on their advice. Now, um, that role of trust is something that, uh, uh, although crucial, is very hard to, to, to generate. Uh, and if you are starting from uh, ground zero, you have very little relationship, uh, you're not known, you're not trusted by these individuals, then uh, how can you go about starting uh, to, to build the kind of trust to become increasingly central within these networks? Um, uh, and uh, you can take a direct approach um, uh, by building relationships with um, uh, members of the policy community who are uh, within those organisations, who are politicians, who are civil servants. 
uh, or you can take a more indirect approach and build relationships uh, with the science policy interfaces, with the uh, organisations who dynamically uh, interact more or less with those politicians and civil service organisations and agencies and, and other fora, uh, the, you know, the machinery of government, um, more or less depending on the issue space and, and what they're doing at that, at, at that time. Uh, uh, whether you go direct or indirect, um, there uh, is uh, a, a series of steps that, that you can take um, to, to make this happen. Uh, and this now comes back to the same paper uh, with the, the evidence um, the, from this case study of uh, evidence uh, about uh, soils and climate change in Scottish Government, where we've used this case study to showcase some of the methods that you can use to start to systematically research uh, who are these people in this policy community or policy network who might have more or less influence? Uh, how you, might you then systematically start thinking about who you are going to reach out to um, and, uh, and try and build relationships, try and form trust with? Uh, essentially, this is a, a group of tools uh, and they are traditionally called stakeholder analysis. Uh, I've uh, researched this quite heavily over the years, published a few papers on this, and um, I call this uh, publics, plural, uh, forward slash uh, stakeholder analysis, because for me this is as valuable for identifying publics and prioritising publics as it is for identifying and prioritising uh, stakeholders and organisations. Uh, as a tool, this is something that came out of the business management literature in the 1980s um, and uh, at the time it was um, uh, suggested that this was something that you could use uh, to, uh, I quote, neutralise uh, stakeholder threats to your company's profits. Uh, and what I and many others have done over the years uh, as we have repurposed this in the environmental domain is to actually turn that on its head and suggest that this is in fact a tool you can use to empower the voiceless uh, and actually enable uh, those, those people um, to, uh, to compromise profits of companies if uh, as a result of that profiteering uh, we, we may be compromising environmental sustainability. Um, uh, I'll give you some links to, to some of those uh, those papers if you want to look at this as a tool in greater depth. Um, in the new paper um, that uh, th where I have this case study, though, we've tried to, to shift this forward uh, a step. Um, uh, and crucially, what uh, I'm suggesting here now is that uh, you can use this to identify publics. Now, a lot of people just figure that there is this thing called the general public, um, and uh, I'm going to instantly just say there is no such thing uh, as the general public. Uh, instead, there are publics, uh, many different uh, publics who have different characteristics, whether they be demographic characteristics uh, or different types of interest that they may have. Uh, and based on those characteristics, they will be more or less interested in the evidence that you have, in the projects that you're running, the things that you are doing. Uh, they will also vary uh, in relation to their relative benefit. And there will be some publics who will benefit far more than other publics from interacting with your evidence, your work. Uh, and so uh, in this diagram, uh, you can see these two axes and uh, you have uh, the easy to reach target publics in the top right quadrant. Uh, and they're fairly easy, they will come along to your events, they'll engage with you, they'll be all over your online stuff, great. More pr problematic, however, are the hard to reach publics. Uh, and these are groups that, uh, for whatever reason, uh, are not particularly interested in what you're doing, uh, but if you could reach them, they would actually benefit from what you're doing far more than many other groups within the public. Uh, and so you need to work out, is this a cultural problem? Is it a language barrier? How can I make this interesting enough, relevant enough uh, for them to engage and then hence hopefully to, to benefit? Uh, there are then um, these other groups um, who are hugely interested but uh, who are not going to benefit much. Um, that's not really a problem uh, unless it lulls you into a false sense of security that uh, actually this is all working great because there are loads of people engaging with us uh, and then you realise that actually they're not the target groups that you really want to affect change with. 
Uh, so I've done work with universities where they've done uh, public engagement activities and uh, had loads of people, but actually the vast majority of them are staff and students who are hugely interested in their work because it helps them uh, to learn more for their studies. Um, but actually they're not the communities that they're actually trying to reach out to uh, and help. Uh, this is a tool that helps you prioritise. So in the bottom uh, left quadrant, you can see these other publics. Uh, and that's fine, you can engage with them if you have time. Um, but if I've got limited time, there are some groups that I will leave till last. Uh, you can choose how you want to prioritise, but the point is the tool gives you a way of thinking about how you will now prioritise which publics to uh, engage with. Um, uh, and you can reach out to them in priority order. So I often will prioritise the hard to reach first. Now, for me, this is a, an important precursor to then engaging with policy stakeholders, because if you are engaging in a, a democratic policy process, it is important to be able to demonstrate that there is public interest in what you're doing and there is public benefit in what you're doing. Uh, and what better way to explore that and to demonstrate that and to provide proof of concept than to be able to systematically identify those publics and to have started to engage with them and to start deriving benefits for those groups. Uh, and now, through your policy engagement, uh, you're suggesting ways in which you can mainstream this uh, and take these things to scale. So, uh, in terms of now my, um, uh, my stakeholder analysis, uh, I have, uh, in this second diagram, replaced uh, the benefit axis for an influence axis. And so my policy stakeholders um, and other stakeholders will vary in relation to their interest in my work, but also now in relation to their influence. There will be some who are hugely influential. Uh, that key government department, that key UN agency, or whoever it is, uh, that I have to absolutely reach out to and understand what their interests are and how I can connect with their agendas. More problematic, however, are uh, the groups in this top left quadrant who are hard to reach for whatever reason. And uh, I think um, most problematic is um, when these become um, uh, gatekeepers. Uh, and what now happens is uh, you've identified someone who is not that interested in what you're doing. It's perhaps a, a small slither of uh, their uh, overall policy remit or what their organisation has to do. It's not high enough priority politically at the moment, for example. And so they don't respond to your emails, they don't pick up the phone, you can't get in touch with them. Uh, and so you figure, well, hey, we'll just go on with this anyway. Uh, and then you discover halfway through your project that actually there's a problem. Now this person is interested and they actually don't like what you're doing and they are going to block you. They are going to prevent you getting access to data, to people, to funding or whatever you need. And now you can't achieve what you want in policy terms or in other terms. Uh, of course, that um, negative blocking role can occur uh, with uh, the, the top right quadrant as well. Uh, on the one hand, this may be a key organisation that can put your work into policy. Equally, this could be a third sector organisation, it could be a, a lobby group, it could be an industry group who really hate what you're doing. Uh, this is against their interests uh, and they have a lot of power to try and block you and you need to know who they are up front. Uh, in the case study I've given you in, the, in my paper with our soils and climate work, um, uh, we did one of these analyses and discovered quite early on that there was one major um, third sector organisation who was ideologically opposed to the pathway to impact that me and my colleagues wanted to pursue with one of these 70 different research findings. Uh, equally, we discovered through this analysis that there was a, a second third sector organisation who was ideologically aligned with what we wanted to do and equally powerful. Uh, and so we worked with the ideologically aligned third sector organisation to then try and change the minds of people at board level within this other organisation. In the end, we actually changed uh, our pathway to impact, we compromised, uh, and we were able to find a way to, to work together. But we did that before we ever even started talking to members of the policy community, because we didn't want to go in uh, with what might look like a, a conflicting evidence base, where we were going against a very powerful player here. So, uh, hugely beneficial to, to identify these people up from, whether they are for you or against you, so you can find ways of working together uh, as you move into the policy domain. 
Uh, finally, there is this bottom right quadrant, uh, and this is more eth ethically challenging, and this is where you can do that table turning exercise that, that I told you about earlier on. Uh, because these may be marginalised voices, people who don't have a lot of power, but who would love to influence you for good or for ill. Uh, and uh, what I like to do now is to identify uh, these groups and through this analysis to identify how they may align with um, uh, interests of organisations who are more influential uh, and then have a stakeholder advisory panel or through other activities as part of my work, I'm bringing these groups together so that I can empower and, 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 uh, and give voice to these groups um, uh, through that kind of action research, co-productive kind of process. Um, uh, with both of these you can kind of mix and match these, ask yourself the benefit question, ask yourself the influence question interchangeably, whatever works most effectively for you. Uh, this is about priorities. priorities. Uh, you will run out of time. Um, and for me, this is saying, well, hey, if I've got time to reach out to three organisations in the next three months, and I reach out to one per month, and I spend 15 minutes per month, uh, I'm going to accept that I've got limited time, but at least in the time that I have, I know that I've been systematic and I've reached out to those who can benefit most and who will have most influence to actually affect policy change for the public interest. Uh, now, I'm just putting up here um, uh, an example um, uh, of a table that shows how uh, I, I do this in practice, um, so uh, you can download this, um, uh, and it's quite self-explanatory, um, and it helps you to think through how you might articulate uh, the various different interests and the nature of the benefit and the influence uh, that they may have, uh, so that you can start to think that bit more systematically about how you might begin to design a pathway to policy impact. My final point, then, is that uh, now you have a sense of who this, who is in this policy network, who are the key players, who are the intermediaries, who might you be able to trust, uh, and who might you then be able to gain trust with in order to start to influence policy change alongside these formal uh, policy mechanisms. Um, you need to start making a plan. Uh, and uh, for me, this is a systematic thing and it's a very logical thing. Uh, and what I use uh, is something called a logic model. Uh, and in this paper uh, that I'll give you access to, you can see, uh, again, we've used uh, our case study of soils and climate research to illustrate how this works uh, and how this actually does generate genuine policy change that makes a difference. Uh, and, uh, and essentially, this is a logic model that is driven by its, uh, its, its goals. Uh, like any good logic model, you start with a very clear goal. If this is what I want to achieve, then how am I then going to uh, set about achieving that systematically? Uh, now, for many of the people I work with, uh, actually coming up with a clear goal is actually the, the biggest hurdle. Uh, and if that is you, then you really do need to back up and do a systematic public stroke stakeholder analysis and really take that step of empathy. Put yourself in the shoes of those policymakers, of those third sector organisations, the people who love what you do, who might hate what you do, really understand where they're coming from. And uh, if actually you're not very clear um, uh, as a result of this, this analysis, if there are lots of blanks, then you go and do your research uh, on the internet, uh, picking up the phone, going and talking to people, really understanding now through workshops, through interviews, where are these people coming from? What are they thinking about? How do they feel about these issues? Get yourself into their shoes so that you can start to come up with some goals that will be of genuine interest to them, that will resonate with them, that will be a real benefit. For, for them uh, in their context, as part of their agenda, uh, in their lives. Uh, so you can then start in this tool um, from columns two and three, where you've got um, your rudimentary stakeholder analysis. Um, and if you've done the, that public stakeholder anal analysis, you can just copy and paste that into, into those two columns. And you can work back, well, if this is their interest, uh, then if that interest is indulged, then what might be the benefit? Um, uh, and going from quite basic benefits through to then bigger scale public benefits and possibly a, a, a benefit from some kind of policy. 
It's still probably quite vague, which is fine at this point, because then you need to work forward from there. Well, if this is vaguely where we, where we might want to go in policy terms, uh, with these specific stakeholder organisations, publics, um, around these particular interests, then now what activities might I design uh, to reach these groups around these particular messages or bits of evidence coming out of my work? Uh, and it may be that there are very different activities you would do for a government, government minister compared to reaching out to uh, a policy or a, an evidence analyst within civil servants, service or a business. Um, think about their needs, how they're going to access that information, how, um, what kind of messages uh, are going to be of most relevance to them uh, and tailor your activities accordingly. Next, you need to come up with some indicators that will tell you if your activities are working um, and will tell you if, in fact, you have achieved impacts or you are on the road to achieving those impacts. Are there milestones, things that would suggest this is moving in the right direction, not the wrong direction? Uh, I like to say now, uh, and means of measurement here, where I'm asking you now, um, uh, how will you know that that activity worked? Um, how will you know that you have reached impact? What could you measure? What could you evaluate in qualitative terms? What might someone say to you? And if you're struggling at this point, I ask people to close your eyes and just imagine now you're five years in the future and it's the most amazing policy impact that you could possibly imagine. Uh, this has changed lives, it saved habitats, whatever it is. What does it look like? There's someone standing in front of you. What are they saying to you? This has changed their life. How? Uh, and if you can get this really measurable and you've got these means of, of, of verification or uh, of evaluation there as well, then now you can revisit that impact goal uh, and you can make this a smart goal. So it's specific, measurable, achievable, realistic, timely. Finally, then, uh, there are a bunch of things you can do at the end of this table to then put this into practice. Um, uh, you might want to think about some of the risks and assumptions that you're making. Um, so great, that's my impact goal, that's my dream scenario, but what if it goes wrong? What if it doesn't work? What if it leads to the negative unintended consequences? Can I identify them? Can I work out how I might mitigate them as part of my pathway to impact? Um, and who's going to do what, by when, what resources do I need? For me, the final step is to kind of take a bird's eye view of this. I'm sitting back from this now and, uh, and I'm asking myself systematically, right, for each of these different pathways, um, which of them are most credible? Uh, given my resources, my skills, the amount of time or money that I've got, my team members, which of these can I actually realistically do uh, and make work? Uh, which of these are actually going to lead to impressive benefits for people that I care about and that I know that other people care about? And based on that, now I'm prioritising the impacts and the pathways that are most impressive and are most credible and are going to work for me so I don't waste my time going down dead ends uh, and doing things that are not going to work um, or, or just really not that interesting or, or, or relevant or significant. So uh, this is essentially uh, my approach to working um, within the formal system um, and not then just leaving it to chance that my consultation response gets read, that my uh, uh, committee hearing, um, my uh, evidence to an inquiry uh, actually makes it to the right person, actually makes change. The, the stuff that went into that science policy interface special report actually makes a difference. I'm not leaving this to chance, I'm following this up. Uh, I'm developing policy briefs, I'm going and I'm doing seminars with those policy briefs. Uh, I'm researching actually whether my policy brief is filling an evidence gap uh, and I'm not just presenting my research, I'm trying to synthesise wherever possible other people's uh, research. Uh, I'm doing this fundamentally in a relational way where I'm building relationships, I'm building trust, whether directly with members of government uh, and organisations who make policy decisions or indirectly with those who they trust and who inform them. Uh, and I'm doing all of this in a systematic way and because this is systematic it works and crucially it's efficient. I'm not wasting time, uh, I'm spending what valuable time I do have working with those who can affect most change and uh, who can benefit most. In so doing, uh, I have, uh, I hope now, achieved uh, the learning objectives uh, that we set for this session. Um, uh, we know how to prioritise stakeholders for engagement, 
uh, in the co-production of policy and practice in sustainable land management around evidence uh, around soil, around climate change, uh, for example, but in this in this space more generally. Um, and I hope you have a, a more nuanced understanding of the role of intermediary organisations and individuals as uh, as knowledge brokers, um, uh, as boundary organisations that uh, operate in, in the space between those who have influence and can connect them with each other and can connect them to people like you and I who may have knowledge that is of use, who may have evidence that they can put uh, into policy uh, or practice. Uh, I hope you have an evidence-based understanding now of what works, both in theory and in practice, when you are trying to achieve positive benefits from, from research uh, into policy. Um, and uh, by taking a systematic approach, I hope you now have some uh, both time and resource saving techniques that can enable you to achieve policy impact from your research. Uh, you have available to you my latest paper, which is um, uh, coming out in the journal Evidence and Policy with this case study. Uh, also downloadable worksheets that you can use to do a stakeholder publics analysis that you can use to use this logic model now to systematically plan uh, for impact. Uh, some of my other literature on, uh, on, these, on these tools. Um, so you can delve into this. Uh, this is a fast-moving field, uh, and so uh, I'm constantly publishing new stuff, uh, and the best place to find this is uh, a website I've set up uh, dedicated to enabling people who generate and work with evidence to get that evidence to the places where it will make a difference. Fast Track Impact is the spin-out company that I run based on my research to train researchers around the world how they can generate and share knowledge in new ways so that they can change the world. FastTrackImpact.com is my website. Go to the Resources tab and there you can see a whole load of downloadable uh, and editable templates like the ones that I've shown you in, uh, in this talk. Uh, but also um, research impact guides. Um, I've got some best practice libraries, examples of good practice. Uh, I've got my podcast. I've got uh, a free uh, magazine, uh, books, a whole load of stuff on there. Everything apart from my books is free on this website. Uh, so go and use this and enjoy. Uh, and uh, also on the contact page, how to get in touch with me if you want to discuss anything that I said, find out more uh, and take this further. Thank you.